It's a spring night in Nazi-occupied Paris, an unusually cold one, the frigid temperatures magnified by the near incessant downpour. Even so, the City of Lights is uncharacteristically quiet, with the patter of rain being interrupted only by the occasional chatter of Wehrmacht patrols or the hurried footsteps of Parisians rushing home before curfew shutters down on them. But there is life here somewhere. On the Rue Royale, in Paris's 8th arrondissement, a soft, brassy glow is cast onto the wet cobbled streets from the window of a nearby restaurant. It's the famous bistro Maxims. The bistro is bustling and its aroma is rich with ingredients that have become increasingly scarce for the average Parisian since the occupation. Inside sit a gaggle of Wehrmacht and Parisian elites, gorging themselves on fine wine, bread, cheese, and all manner of other delicacies. In one corner, a Wehrmacht colonel dines with a French collaborator. In another, the top brass of the Paris military headquarters treat themselves to an extravagant meal. Nowhere to be found, however, is a normal Frenchman. No, it is only the German occupiers who get to skirt Paris's stringent rationing quotas and indulge in what used to be the city's most famed hallmark, good food. Just a few minutes' walk from Maxim's, German officers are drinking in all the pleasures of one of Paris's high-end brothels, Le 122. The average soldier, however, not being able to afford the rates of a finer institution, settles with one of Paris's many street prostitutes. A practice that German high command have been trying to crack down on. Due to their obsession with hygiene, German soldiers are permitted only to visit brothels cleared for use by medical professionals who conduct regular medical examination of sex workers. For soldiers accustomed to the relative prudishness of Germany, Paris must have seemed a cornucopia of pleasures and excess. For one soldier, Robert Fucher, recently permitted a visit to Paris after months at a rural posting, it was a city of plenty. In this 21st edition of the Deutsche Wegleiter, he describes the thrills of visiting the Moulin Rouge Cabaret, whose quote scantily clad girls were a far cry from what was on offer in the homeland. He went on to praise the Parisian metro, the charmingly narrow streets of the Bohemian Quarter, and the many coffee shops and boulevards. He writes that the city had given him a taste of civilized life again, after months on duty. Flucher was one of the many lucky soldiers who had the opportunity to visit Paris, presumably through the Nazi Kraft durch Freude, or Strength through Joy, program, a system of holiday allocation first implemented in Germany in the 1930s to keep morale and thus productivity high. Through the KDF system, Paris became a thoroughfare of touristic activity for Wehrmacht personnel during the occupation period, with sightseeing tours organized for visiting soldiers. One Russian journalist staying in Paris during the occupation wrote that, quote, every day tens of buses filled with soldiers and brassy blonde German women in mouse grey uniforms stopped in front of Notre Dame, the Invalides, and other monuments of the city. The German Kraft durch Freude organization made visits to the marvels of the capital for its new tourists. Another famed journalist, the American William Shire, noted that, quote, most of the German troops act like naive tourists. And this has proved a pleasant surprise to the Parisians. It seems funny, but every German soldier carries a camera. Wehrmacht tourism in Paris was booming, with German authorities claiming that as many as one million German soldiers had been given tours of the city between June of 1940 and May of 1941. The extent of military tourism within occupied Paris is further reflected in the previously mentioned Deutsche Wegleiter. This official guidebook, translated into English as The German Guide, was written by the Wehrmacht headquarters in Paris and made available to garrisoned and visiting soldiers free of charge. An issue of the Wegleiter was released every two weeks and included instructions for navigating Paris's metro system. 
The Underground Railway was something that many soldiers found particularly difficult to wrap their heads around. As most cities in Germany, lacked any form of underground public transportation. Also enclosed within the guide was a rundown of popular sites, restaurants and museums, as well as a detailed overview of upcoming opera performances and nightclub events. For information on the more central attractions Paris had to offer, soldiers could consult one of the German language newspapers that had been established since the city fell under their control. One such newspaper, the Paris at Zeitung made recommendations on which erotic venues hosted the best shows, the most attractive of which was apparently the Cabaret Tabarin. It was not uncommon to see an ocean of dark grey uniforms at many of these venues, with the historian Alan Riding estimating that at one cabaret theatre, Les Folies Bergères, around 80% of all the attendees were German. So. Paris was crawling with Germans, but not just because it was an occupied city, no. It was replete with them because it was a city which they gave begrudging respect. They were fascinated by the beautiful architecture and art and seduced by its food and entertainment. For soldiers that had only ever heard of Paris or seen it in photos, the opportunity to experience it was an irresistible one. One German infantryman exclaimed upon entering Paris on bicycle that he had never seen such a beautiful city. Another called it a second spiritual fatherland. It was this fascination that saw Paris spared much of the violence and destruction that its sister cities and the rest of France suffered. Essentially, even though the Germans in principle viewed the French and their culture as inferior and backwards, in practice they were not about to demolish one of Europe's most sophisticated and beautiful cities. In fact, all the better that they enjoy it. So they did. Germany turned Paris into a rest and relaxation centre for its soldiers, a resort intended to provide reprieve from the stresses of the front. It was so effective in this regard that soldiers started to employ the saying Leben wie Gott in Frankreich, or live like God in France. Paris and occupied France acquired this reputation relative to the conditions elsewhere in Europe which were far worse. For example, one German soldier stationed in Angers committed suicide when he was informed that he would be redeployed to the Eastern Front to fight the Soviets. The campaign in the East was so much worse than life in France that someone saw fit to take their own life rather than suffer a near-death sentence anyway in a war-torn region destitute of all comforts. Even in areas untouched by fighting, such as mainland Germany, rationing and rearmament had reduced the availability of staple goods and made life gruelling and monotonous. In Paris, a soldier could have a fling with a local French girl, take a stroll down opulent boulevards and indulge in good food. Another plus was that it was just about as far away from fighting as one could be in occupied Europe. It was a life to be envied by every Wehrmacht soldier. But while German soldiers enjoyed the riches of Paris, the local French citizenry languished. Although they enjoyed a degree of normalcy and comfort not found in areas such as occupied Poland and Ukraine, the French were still second-class citizens in this new Europe. They suffered through malnourishment while their German occupiers dined like kings, and to add insult to injury, to keep up with food demand, many Parisian students were conscripted to work in farming. So, they may have been toiling in the fields for food that would only land on the table of a Wehrmacht officer instead of their own. This sort of conscription, which was initially voluntary, acquired a more mandatory character as the war entered its later years. By February of 1943, the STO, or Compulsory Labour Service, was in full effect, levying thousands of able-bodied Frenchmen to work in Germany. Domestically, the mandatory draft was seen in a very negative light, with it sometimes being characterized as a way for Germans to, quote, kidnap French youths away from their families. Violence against French citizens was also present. Political dissidents, students and Jews were surveyed, arrested or sent to forced labor camps. That is, if they were lucky. Otherwise, it was not uncommon for people to, quote, disappear after the Gestapo made a midnight visit to their apartment. 
These unfortunate souls were often subjected to torture, with some even dying in the process. In total, 30,000 French civilians would be executed by German security services, a statistic that is almost certainly too low given the clandestine nature of their operations. To make things harder, the Gestapo destroyed stacks of incriminating documents prior to the Allied liberation of Paris in August of 1944. This loss of data likely obscures the true death count. Another disheartening reality of occupation was that Paris was consistently a pawn in the power game between the Vichy French puppet state and their German masters. Reflecting this, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre described how Paris had become a shadow of its former self. He said Paris owed its, quote, languorous existence to the number of freight trains and trucks the Germans let enter each week. Whenever Vichy became uncooperative, whenever the Vichy president dragged his feet when it came to providing Berlin workers, the injections were immediately suspended. Paris was fading away and yawned hungrily under the empty sky. So France's most famed and important city was essentially stripped of its agency, its autonomy. For the average citizen, it was as if Paris had become purgatory. Its role as a political, industrial, artistic centre had wilted away as if overnight. The streets that had been built for bustling crowds and a purposeful existence became the backdrop to a mechanical life. This all the while, German soldiers traipsed through their city as if it were an oversized resort, pillaging their food stores for their own benefit and enacting political repression against their citizens. The reason Paris became a resort city in the first place for the Wehrmacht is because there was a delicate balance of artificial normalcy that had been established between French citizens and German occupiers. Germans were initially polite, respectful, and for the most part, kept their jackboots out of the mouths of regular citizens. The French, for their own part, mostly accepted the German presence, with Sartre describing them as, quote, more furniture than men. So, French citizens depersonalized the occupiers, and therefore were able to ignore them and get on with their lives more easily. This artificial normalcy, which lent itself to Paris being a city of escapism for Wehrmacht soldiers, was gradually ruined by the war with the Soviet Union in 1941. Tensions between French citizens and Germans flared, shattering the illusion of normalcy preferred for tourism. As the war against the Soviets evolved in the favor of the Allies, collaboration with Germans became less commonplace as French people realized liberation may be possible. The delicate balance where French people meekly accepted the German presence as a fact of life and therefore let the Wehrmacht use the city however they liked, was broken. It became a lot harder to enjoy some, quote, rest and relaxation as soldiers became preoccupied with combating resistance fighters and trying to prevent the next metro bombing. By 1943, all recreational tourism was permanently suspended as wartime demands for manpower in the East grew. The propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, justified the change through the phrase Quote, first victory, then travel, unquote. So recreational trips to Paris became exceptionally rare, and only those stationed there would still get to occasionally enjoy its perks. Reading the Deutsche Wegleiter, you might have been fooled into thinking nothing had changed, though, since they continued to publish and recommend sites, shows and restaurants right up until Paris was liberated by the Allies. Its final issue this beige book was printed only 13 days before the city was freed from German occupation. So ends the story of how the Germans turned Paris into their resort. It seems a little absurd that Wehrmacht soldiers, who were perhaps destined for the Eastern Front to fight and kill and potentially commit horrendous war crimes, at one point just acted like regular naive tourists in Paris. It's difficult to imagine these soldiers were regular people, and yet they were. They picked up their cameras just as any regular tourist would and strolled down to the Eiffel Tower to make memories and take pictures. Their French hosts would rather they had not been there at all 
It was essentially tourism without consent. But Paris will never see the likes of it again. <laughs>